clerk at the National Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. After that, he was a postdoc at the University of California, Santa Cruz, at Caltech, and at Rutgers. We are very fortunate to have him as a staff scientist now in the theoretical division of Los Alamos National Lab, where Michael does research in dark matter, gravity, and theoretical subatomic physics. He's a nationally and internationally recognized physicist. He has uh, many publications in journals like Physical Review Letters, Physics Letters, these, and Journal of Biomedical Physics. He's a very important part of our group of the theory division and of Los Alamos. We're very pleased to have him speak this evening on the Hidden Falls on the Nelly. Thank you. It's uh, thrilling to see uh, so many people come out and uh, hear about this new protocol that was just discovered just a few months ago. So, thank you for coming. So, one thing that's uh, very exciting about being a physicist is being able to a go between processes which seem very abstract, which is shown, shown on the left hand side of um, my title slide here. This shows two quarks coming in. This is what's called a Feynman diagram. It shows two quarks coming in and colliding and producing something called the, well, in this series, the Higgs boson. And so, this is something that theoreticians can write down, and, and what's a very uh, very nice is to, to go to something that's very complicated on the right hand side, and I'll get into more, to, um, more of this. The right hand side shows a uh, candidate Higgs boson event that was seen in one of the experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. This is a very complicated thing, and this is something that's pretty simple, and there's a, a very uh, a strong connection between the two of them, and that's very nice about physics and, and what we've actually seen in physics uh, for the past several centuries. So I thought I would begin by talking about, well, what is a particle, since I'm going to be talking about the Higgs boson and some of the other, other particles that we know exist in nature. So, well, you know, what is a particle? I've shown some things here. These are marbles. As kids, we all play with marbles. We just smash them together. They bounce around. And they basically exhibit, exhibit particle-like behavior. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have some pollen grains. They, too, can also behave like particles. You can drop them in some water and then They'll just swirl around and be suspended there for, for a little while. And so those two, you could also mention, also describe as being characterized as a particle. What I want to talk about today is uh, something that actually goes back a long while. I guess maybe a lot of talks in physics begin with the Greeks. And uh, back in, well, when the Greeks were around, uh, Democritus had this idea that there should be ir irreducible things in nature, something, things in nature that make up matter that should be, uh, is particular in nature, and there shouldn't be anything smaller than that, and that's what he called atoms. What I'm showing here in this transparency is a simulation of uh, an observation by Robert Brown back in 1829 of what's now called Brownian motion, and what he was observing were pollen grains suspended in water, moving around, and he was describing the erratic motion of those pollen grains. And even though people were beginning to talk or consider this idea of atoms very serious in its day, it wasn't actually until the early 1900s, uh, due to the work of Einstein and some other people, I believe, that really characterized this motion mathematically under the assumption that there were little molecules that were randomly hitting that pollen grain. And from being able to describe that motion mathematically and in agreement with what Brown and other people saw, people became convinced that atoms exist, existed. Well, the idea of atoms didn't last too long. Uh, here I'm showing uh, Ernest Rutherford, who's a famous physicist at the turn of the 1900s, who made a number of fundamental contributions. And uh, I don't know if you can see this up here. I like this slide because up here it says, please speak softly. And uh, he was known for having a very booming voice. And so I find it amusing that he had this uh, right above his head, I guess, so he couldn't see it. I'm not sure why. And so what I'm showing here is this famous experiment of his where he took uh, helium atoms that have been ionized and he was firing them at, uh, in this case, gold targets and just looking to see what happened. He was detecting where those helium atoms, ionized helium atoms, were being uh, detected within his experiment. It was actually his students that were doing this, Geiger and Marston. And every now and then, Geiger and Marston observed a recoil of that, one of those helium nuclei coming back directly towards the target. And 
Uh, and I guess a lot of them characterized it back then. It was as he was firing a bullet at a piece of tissue paper and seeing the bullet come back. That's how stunning it was for them. And what they inferred from that at the time is that, well, actually, the atom isn't made up of this sort of globular big thing, but it's made up of something very tiny and has, has real hard core, and that's what uh, his helium nuclei were scattering off of the Mikoshin factor. Well, Rutherford continued to fire ionized helium atoms at other targets. Up here I'm showing Chadwick, who was a student of his at the time, and Rutherford. They were firing ionized helium atoms. In this case, uh, they were firing them at some gas. And, they, and what they were finding was also very surprising. At the time, they were finding hydrogen left over. So they did very careful measurements of the gas, and they, made, they traced it down to nitrogen. And then they found that there was just some hydrogen left over when they're firing the helium atom at the the nitrogen. So what they found then, and uh, this was surprising around 1919, that actually what they thought of as being something solid, the nucleus in my previous slide, was actually something that could be fragmented even further. So this nucleus, this nitrogen nucleus, which they thought was something that was just something solid, itself could be fragmented into things further, in this case into hydrogen. That's how they got hydrogen in the experiment. Well, back then, Rutherford thought that, well, there had to be, so the nucleus he thought was made up of things, and he came up uh, with the name nucleus that we uh, now have today for this object. But he also coined uh, the term neutron, and he proposed that actually there were other particles inside the nucleus other than just the hydrogen uh, uh, atom, which means, I mean, the, the, uh, the nucleus of the hydrogen atom, which we know as the proton. He also gave us that name. He proposed that there were also neutrons which make up, make up this nucleus. And so he, he then and Chadwick began a 12 year quest to try to find this particle that was the neutron that was also inside the nucleus. And uh, I should say, for those of you who know some of this, actually, Rutherford's neutron wasn't the neutron that we know of today. He thought the neutron was actually a proton and electron bound together, but he was convinced that there had to be some other particle inside the nucleus other than just some proton. And that's because when you look at the mass of the nucleus, and you look at its charge, then it isn't just some, the, the charge isn't simply just the, the number of um, positively charged uh, hydrogen nuclei that would be in there. So Chadwick began working for 12 years for this neutron, and I, I think he looks a little apprehensive in this photo, when you say? I think he looks apprehensive. And the reason he's looking apprehensive is because he's looking over at these two, Irene and Frederick Joliet. Curie, Irene Jolie, I mean, Irene Curie was the daughter of the famous Madame Curie, and they were doing experiments where they too were firing ionized helium atoms, also known as alpha particles, at targets, and they were finding protons coming out. And they were convinced that they had seen uh, what were called gamma rays back then, so ignore the thing in the middle now for just a moment, they were seeing gamma rays, and gamma rays are just very energetic uh, photons. So that's why he was apprehensive, because he saw their experiment and what they'd done, and he went and talked to Rutherford, and they both agreed, ah, those guys, the Chaldean Curious, they discovered neutrons. And so the story goes, he worked very hard for a month, and uh, he, uh, he proved conclusively that actually these new particles had properties very similar to protons, just that they don't have any charge. And so that's how the neutron was discovered, and he got the Nobel Prize for that just a few years later. The reason I bring up the neutron in this story is because this now leads us to, uh, now looking back with hindsight back 80 years or so, it's actually how the Higgs boson enters into the story. And that comes to this phenomenon called beta decay, which actually has been observed for a very long time, back into the late 1800s, it was discovered by Becquerel. And what it describes is a very destroyed <coughs> nucleus changes its, so actually an element, I should say, sorry, changes its charge and emits what was called a beta ray back then. Later they found out that these things called beta rays, which are shown schematically in this picture here, beta rays are the same as electrons. So it's actually an illustration of one thing that we like to do in science is to try to unify ideas and try to, try to see different things that are different phenomena as actually being the same thing or somehow related. So that happened pretty early on. So we have this nuclei, which then emits uh, a beta ray, and it changes its charge. And people spend a, a fair amount of time trying to understand this process. And that's where Lisa Meitner comes in. She and Otto Hahn 
we're very carefully trying to measure the spectrum of the electrons that are coming out. So you can go ahead and measure, so you look at, have a, an element that does a transmutation, and then you get an electron that comes out, you measure its energy, and just see what you get. And it was very controversial. They thought that maybe they should be seeing just a single line, and if you had a single line, then that would mean that you really just had uh, basically one thing decaying into two things. And they came along and they had some evidence that actually it was a continuous spectrum. That's what I've shown down here. It's, uh, so it's here is the number of events versus the energy of this electron. So this is not a line, this is a continuous spectrum. But even after the work of Otto Hahn and Lisa Meitner, which is still controversial, and actually took James Chadwick when he was much younger, when he was a student, and he came on and came along and did some very nice measurements and demonstrated that the spectrum was very, that it was actually continuous. And the reason that was important is because this was a real puzzle, because they could, they could not understand how you could get one thing going to two and getting a continuous spectrum. And this caused Neil Bohr to speculate that energy would be conserved, which is a pretty radical uh, assumption even uh, for today's theoretical, I mean, proposal for today's theoretical physicists. But actually, it was these two people, uh, Rico Fermi and uh, Von Yenko, and actually this third person, uh, Wolfgang Pauli, who actually began to put together some of these pieces. And the first important contribution came from Pauli. He actually proposed no energy is conserved. What's happening is actually there's a new particle that's being produced. And he called it a neutron, which is a little confusing, but it's not the neutron I'm talking about here, but it was renamed a neutrino by Fermi. So he proposed actually that the neutrino is being produced in this decay. So here we have uh, another example of a new particle being proposed to solve a uh, physical problem. So he proposed the neutrino being produced. Now, as I said before, at that time, people thought the neutron was still made of a proton and electron. But it was Dmitry Avinenko who said, no, we should think of the neutron and the proton as the same thing. So the proton and the electron are not combined together to make the neutron. And finally, it was Fermi who came along. This is actually a bad photograph from him uh, when he was here at uh, on the Manhattan Project just for a little while, he actually came up with a theory that explained uh, how the neutron could go into a proton, an electron, and a neutrino in a quantitative way. And this was the very first time that we saw two new things. One was we saw that you could actually produce a new particle that didn't exist before. So we shouldn't think of these three particles as being inside the neutron. They're not. They're just spontaneously created. And the other thing is he really, uh, if you like, described a new force in nature that we now call the weak interactions, and that's where the Higgs boson comes in. So already at around the 1930s, we see that what we think of as being a fundamental particle is, is actually not fundamental, and it's, it's actually been changing with time. Our ideas of particles, uh, it's actually really just a concept, and that changes with, as our experiments get better and better and probe down to further and further distance scales. So already at that time, we see that atoms are actually made up of electrons and nuclei, but the nuclei themselves are made up of protons, and neutrons that are held together in a very, very little tiny space. And even actually some of these particles aren't even stable. The neutron can actually decay, as I was showing you in the previous slide. And that has a lifetime of about 10 minutes. There's also huge distance scales here. So if you imagine the atoms were actually 10 kilometers across, and actually I have to read this because I can't remember all these scales. The uh, atom was 10 kilometers across, then the protons and the neutrons would be about 10 centimeters. That's how small they are. Uh, that many order of magnitudes between the two. And then what we've learned recently, in the last 30 or 40 years, is even the proton itself is made up of smaller things. And those are actually, uh, in terms of the scale, if the neutrons and protons are 10 centimeters across, then these quarks would be 0.1 millimeters. And actually, we don't even know if the quarks or the electrons even have any structure at all. In the 1960s, there was a fair amount of ex experimental activity that, and, and theoretical activity that actually convinced scientists that these quarks exist. This is a really fascinating story in the history of particle physics. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about it, but there are two theoreticians, Mary Jo Mann and George Swade, who proposed the idea that there are quarks together that make up a proton and also the neutron, and those are bound together by gluons. So each proton itself has quarks inside them. And so what I mean by an elementary particle, as far as what we know 
today is that an elementary particle is something that doesn't have any structure. So that brings us to the following fundamental particles that we, in that sense, that we know of in nature, or, or the quarks that I was mentioning before that make up the neutron and proton. But actually, there are three copies of that, and that's, they're not, that's not really too relevant for the talk, but it was actually quite a surprise. And then we have these particles here, which are important to the story and also to the story of the Higgs boson. There's a particle called the Z boson, which I'll come to in a little bit of time. The W boson, which we'll see in a moment, is very important to this nuclear beta decay that I was telling you about. There's the gluon that I already mentioned, which binds all these particles together, uh, the quarks together, to form the neutron and proton. And then there's the photon, that is the quanta of light. So actually now with the discovery of this uh, new particle at CERN, which maybe is the Higgs boson, we actually have three types of matter in, in the universe. Before we thought there were only two types, the vector bosons, we call them, which are in this column, and these things that are fermions, which are in these columns, but now there's this third new type of matter <coughs> they're going to be talking about uh, more as the talk goes on. Now, one thing I want to mention, and this is actually important for understanding how particles get mass, uh, in particular, I mean, through the Higgs boson, you've probably heard that, well, the Higgs particle gives mass to some of these other elementary particles. So that's not quite true. So in the talk, what I'm going to try to convey to you is actually the field. Uh, it's the Higgs field that gives mass to fundamental particles, some of them. And so I want to talk to you a little bit, and as we go along, about what a field is. Well, these particles that I'm mentioning here are quanta of things, of fields, some of them which we know in nature, the electric and magnetic fields. Well, it turns out these are quanta of the field of the weak interactions, and the gluon is the quanta of the uh, vector fields that this, so the gluon is the thing that binds together the quarks. And, and so that's, yeah, that's what, what I wanted to, to say about that. So the Higgs field, this is what I was saying before, the Higgs field is the thing that's responsible for giving mass to quarks and to uh, particles like the electron. It's not the Higgs particle. And actually it's the, uh, when talking about mass, the, the Higgs field is giving mass to, uh, it's giving the inertial mass. So if you remember the inertial mass is when you're trying to accelerate an object, that's the resistance the object uh, had or conveyed to the agent that is trying to do the acceleration. So it's the inertial mass that the Higgs field uh, gives mass to. So now I want to talk a little bit about the history of these weak interactions. And what I've shown here is this uh, beta decay that I was telling you about just a few minutes ago. So here we have a neutron, and time goes in this direction, this is a Feynman diagram, and decays into a proton, and a neutrino, and an electron. And what, uh, and what these three people do, did back in the 1960s was able to come up with a mathematical and physical sensible description of that beta decay. And that's where the, the Higgs boson enters. So let me tell you some of that story. At least uh, three people got the Nobel Prize in 1979. <clears throat> so Shelley Glashow began it all, and what he wanted to do is he just wanted to get back uh, Fermi's theory. So Fermi had this theory for nuclear beta decay, so for neutron, nuclear and neutron beta decay. And uh, when you look into the mathematical details of that theory, it turns out you, it doesn't make too much mathematical, ma mathematical sense and, and physical sense. And so he wanted to cure that problem, and he proposed uh, a couple of things. Uh, he pro proposed a new model to do that, but along the way he wanted to propose a symmetry between neutrinos and electrons, which was a pretty bold thing back then because the electrons interact with photons and neutrinos don't. Neutrinos have zero charge. So he did that by introducing, again, another new particle. This is this W boson I was showing on the previous transparency, the two slides back when I was telling you about what was the fundamental particles that we know of in nature. So this is one of them. So he proposed a new particle, but the problem with this theory was that that particle didn't have a mass, it has zero mass, just like the photon does. It has no mass. And that was a really big problem because if that were the case, then the nuclear interactions would be long range. You would have 
Uh, the, nuclear, the nuclear beta decay interactions would be long range and you would they'd be as visible as electric and magnetic fields, which they aren't. So that's a big problem. And he just ignored that, which was pretty bold of him back then. He just said, oh, in his, in his paper, he quote, said it's a stumbling block to his theory. And so, so he just went ahead and said, okay, it's a stumbling block, I'm going to ignore it, I can't solve that now. And he published his paper and he got a Nobel Prize. So, <laughs> so it's, that's, that's pretty good. Well, unbeknownst to glass shell, and also unbeknownst to, I mean, these people also didn't know about glass shell. So, uh, what I'm showing, uh, so these are the people, Grout, Engler, and Higgs, who came up with the Higgs mechanism. Now, when you think of, I mean, the Higgs mechanism, there's only one person there, but actually there are other people involved. These people actually put out their paper, Grout and Engler, a few months before Higgs. And what they proposed, uh, actually, it's the fact that they're actually, as I said before, they didn't even know about uh, glass shell paper. And they didn't, uh, if you go and read their paper, they, they make no reference to glass shell paper. And there's even no mention to the beta decay, these weak interactions. You know, they were concerned about a different problem, mathematically, which is how to just give mass to a certain type of massless particle. So they invented a mechanism to do that. And what they introduced was a field they didn't call it Higgs, because they didn't know about Higgs then. But Higgs field gives mass to these particles like the W and the C, or generalizations of that. And uh, as I said before, they didn't know about it. They were, they, their aim wasn't to actually solve this problem with the weak interaction. Now one thing that Higgs did, so he did the same thing, but very importantly, Higgs pointed out that actually when you do that, when you introduce a new field that gives mass to these particles, that you also get actually a fundamental particle, which we now call the Higgs particle. So you get two things out. You get mass to these particles, but you also get a new particle. And uh, that's one thing that Higgs had over Grout and Engler, that they, uh, they didn't mention, if you go and read their paper, there's no mention of a particle. So that brings us to Salom and Weinberg. So Weinberg knew about Glashow's paper, and Weinberg also knew about Higgs's paper. And it was actually Weinberg who uh, gave us the name the Higgs particle. So he named it after Higgs, because that's usually what happens in physics. If somebody does something before you, you just refer to that by then. It's not always the case. So he applied Higgs's idea of Grout and Engler to glass shell model. So now this W particle now gets a mass. And also, it turns out, when you look at the, the details of this theory, because glass shell proposed the symmetry between the electron and the neutrino, he also produced another, he predicted another new particle in the theory. So that particle too gets mass, and that leads to new interactions, in particular these types, where no neutrinos can interact with matter. And what Weinberg also did is they showed that particles that we know as being fundamental, like the electron and the uh, quarks, uh, also get mass from this mechanism. So just to summarize, so the Higgs field gives mass to electrons and their heavier part, uh, copies also to quarks and to these W and Z bosons, and it turns out it also gives mass to the Higgs particle. And actually, this, so the Higgs boson makes the weak interactions as we know them possible. And here uh, I have, uh, this is an image actually of a, a nebula that was uh, the remnant of a supernova that's the earliest uh, supernova ever known uh, recorded, that was recorded by Chinese astronomers back around AD 100. And the reason that I mentioned, you may wonder, what do supernova remnants have to do with giving mass to particles? Well, it turns out all the elements heavier than iron, or only we think, made within the, when a, super, when a, a heavy star collapses and forms a supernova, and then that supernova explodes. In the process of that explosion, elements heavier than iron are, are made during that. And, Many of those processes that lead to the elements we see today uh, are made possible through these weak interactions, through these radioactive decays. So, for example, strontium, which is an element that's important for biological processes, and you can get from eating a rhizona, that was probably made in something like this somewhere nearby a long time ago, and, uh, and then probably also through one of these weak interaction processes. Now you may wonder, what does a platypus have to do with uh, anything that I'm talking about here? Well, 
depending on, I guess, your sensibility, a platypus may or may not be uh, a beautiful or a creature. I mean, it, it was certainly a surprise to the people, the, the Europeans, I guess, who heard tales about this and eventually saw the platypus that had a bill and then also a laid egg, which is not expected of a placental mammal. And so, in, in that sense, the Higgs boson is a, a bit like the platypus because it is something that is kind of ugly, not too pleasant. And so, to add to that, this is something that Weinberg just added in to solve the problem that he needed to solve, which is to give mass to the particles and blast out model. Now, I also want to mention something else about the Higgs boson. And, uh, my wife is a, uh, is a writer and also a film director. And when I told her about uh, what I was doing here, she said, oh, yeah, that reminds me of a, a quote by Ian Forrester in his aspect of a novel. He was talking about the structure of a, how to write a novel. And Forrester was saying, that, well, imagine that you're giving, a, you're, you're describing a scene where you have some hosts that are giving a party or having a dinner and they're entertaining some guests. Well, in that case, you want to keep the ugly maid in the kitchen. You don't want to bring her out into the dining room where you have all your guests. My response was, well, the Higgs boson is the ugly me, so I can avoid talking about the Higgs boson throughout this talk. So I wanted to tell you about a few other uh, applications where the weak interactions uh, also show up uh, in unfamiliar ways. So one of this is nuclear medicine. There's a process, a medical technique called positron emission tomography, where they administer a radioactive agent, in this case it's some Thing that has some chemical that has fluorine attached to it that's a radioactive nucleotide that goes into the person, and this uh, radioactive nucleotide decays, in this case, by emitting a, a positron, but it's a weak process in tank. That positron hits electrons, which are in the matter of whatever biological tissue is being examined, that creates photons, and then these photons are detected. So, by working backwards, biologists create images of processes that are going on in whatever tissue that they're looking at, and they can do that because of the weak interaction. There's another uh, example, which may be familiar to you, and that's just uh, using uh, radioactive decay to actually date archaeological and fossil artifacts. And so one example is the carbon-14 data decay, where carbon-14 is an unstable element of uh, sorry, not elements, but unstable isotopes of carbon that's produced whenever uh, neutrons in the cosmic ray comes and hits the nitrogen and produces this carbon 14. It has a half life of about 5,700 years. That carbon 14 then gets ingested into uh, you know, an animal or a plant and then it undergoes a radioactive decay, which is actually the same beta decay I was talking about before. And archaeologists can make measurements of the amount of carbon-14 left over and, and infer the age of the object. A more recent discovery, which was pretty spectacular, was just a few years ago. Uh, this, maybe you came in and saw a talk on this, this is the earliest known hominid that we know about. It was dated about 4.4 million years ago by actually a staff scientist at the lab, Gaudet, Mulder, uh, Gabriel, and his uh, other collaborators at these institutions. And uh, so already, uh, already visited Ramada. And uh, this is actually a different process. It's not beta decay, but it's still a weak interaction process. In this case, you have an electron that's uh, captured by a proton, and it emits uh, an electron in the neutrino. And this reaction forms the basis of the types of radioactive uh, methods that are used to determine the age of objects like this. You may have heard carbon. Uh, argon dating, and then there's also more recently argon argon dating. And this weak interaction is, is a process that's very fundamental to uh, the, the whole uh, method. I also want to say, uh, talk about something that's very speculative, but suppose we did have the Higgs boson. Okay. Well, how would things be different? Would anything be different? Well, some things would be different. The electron wouldn't have a mass, and because of that, chemistry would be very different. Atoms would be very different. I'm not sure if atoms would exist, but can. there might be some kind of atom. Uh, I don't know what they would be like, but we probably wouldn't be standing here and listening to me. Uh, maybe you'd be happy about that, but 
but uh, things would be suddenly very different. Uh, I really can't say how, how things would change. But if there was no Higgs boson, then the electron would have uh, no mass. That has other consequences, dimension chemistry. These supernova things would be very different. And also, it's just the generation of these elements that happen in, in these uh, supernova explosions. That would be very different. I can't say how things would be, but uh, I just know they'd be very different. Let me continue now with the story of the weak interactions and the Higgs boson. Well, the Weinberg, Salon, and Glashow model kind of lingered for a language, I should say, for a while because people still couldn't make mathematical sense of those theories, it turns out. Until these two people came along, Feldman and Gerard Sebaut, who showed that actually you can make mathematical sense of those theories, you can make predictions for those theories, and that created a fair amount of excitement in this class of theories. They too also got the Nobel Prize for that back in 1999. But it wasn't just uh, this work alone. There was also a very important experiment that was done uh, around the time that I was born. This is the actual experiment. It doesn't look like much. It's actually just a, a, just like a bathtub. And it's actually outside CERN right now. This is, I believe, the uh, theoretical building at CERN. And they have a little museum there that's outside, but it feels like you're walking on the moon or something with all these things that look like uh, they're from outer space. So they, were, they did an experiment uh, back in, in this time period that really convinced people that the glass shells, uh, glass shell, sorry, Salon and Weinberg model was actually a correct description of nature. It really focused a lot of attention on that theory. So this is a very important experiment. I want to talk a little bit about it. What's shown on the left here is a, a bubble chamber photograph. So their bathtub was, was known as a bubble chamber. And basically what happens is they have some liquid that's kept at near the boiling point. And then they let some particles enter. This is for a long time. They've been smashing some form of particles into some other particles. So they've been smashing, sending in these particles, and then when these particles enter, they reduce the pressure in the system. And what that does is that that reduces the boiling point, which many of us may uh, be familiar with living in Santa Fe, that when you boil water, it's actually not as warm as it is when you, you boil it at sea level because the pressure is a little bit lower up at that altitude. So they reduce the pressure, and now the liquid, which is near, nearly at the boiling point, is now highly unstable in oil, which basically means it forms bubbles. And when these particles go through, they can act as catalysts for that bubbling to happen. And then they have a camera there take a picture, and they create these very, very beautiful photographs. What these show here are all the particles that have been going through, charged particles, which either streak through or create these spirals. These are probably electrons. And this photograph here from their experiment is a very famous photograph because it shows the very first neutral current event that was predicted in the weinberg glashow salon model. It actually doesn't look like much. It just looks like a scratch on a windshield. But actually what's happening here is a whole bunch of things. They had a neutrino beam coming in here that neutrino beam scattered off of an electron that was inside uh, their liquid. So basically the theory predicts a process like this where a neutrino comes in, exchanges through this, has an interaction with the nucleus or an electron through the C particle. Remember I said that this was a new particle that was predicted by Weinberg's, uh, sorry, Glashow's model, this new D particle. Well, this was the first evidence that this thing actually existed. So you had this electron that came, this neutrino came in, created an electron that spiraled around, emitted a photon here, which doesn't leave a track, and then created one another electron, another photon, which doesn't leave a track, and then another electron. And it was based on the basis of this experiment. They had actually looked at 370,000 anti-neutrino events and 370,000 neutrino events, and they just found this one thing out of all those events. And they gather more evidence later, really convinced the community, but it was really the basis of experiments like this that I think uh, it was on the basis of these that the Nobel Committee gave their Nobel Prize uh, to Weinberg and Salon and Glashow back in 1979, even though there was no actual direct evidence for this particle or the other one, the W I mentioned before. Those hadn't been discovered yet. Those were discovered in 1983. And those people also got a Nobel Prize. <laughs> so all these people were getting Nobel Prizes except for Higgs. Even though it's uh, the, Higgs, the, the Higgs mechanism is at the basis of all this phenomena. And that's what I've illustrated here. We have this Higgs particle, and it's really the basis for allowing for 
the beta decays will operate the way that they do with the supernova explosions, allowing us to radio carbon date very old artifacts. Uh, also, it's responsible for generating heat inside the sun. So here you have two hydrogen atoms that are fusing together to eventually give you helium, and heat is produced uh, along the way. And also, indirectly, through uh, the absence of an interaction, just making light behave in the way that we know today. So the Higgs boson is really at the, the Higgs field of Higgs boson is really at the center of, of all of this. So that brings me now to talking just a, a little bit more about fields, because uh, understanding fields is really important to understanding what it is that's giving mass to these particles. So here I've shown a table, and this table is experiencing two types of fields. It's experiencing a gravitational field, which is pulling it down, but it's not going through the floor because there's also some electromagnetic force, electrostatic force that's pushing up on the table. Just like the similar force pushing up on me, and that's why I'm not going through here. The electrostatic, this electromagnetic field, if you like, double, was allowing me to move back and forth. Because I'm using the fact that there's friction on my shoes to move back and forth. So I want to talk about this person. So how many of you uh, know who Charles Dickens is? Okay. Well, this is a Charles Dickens. <laughs> but he, uh, apparently he was as popular as they have Charles Dickens. And uh, this is a very interesting person. Uh, uh, this is Michael Faraday. And uh, the reason I have him here is because he uh, came up with a concept, which, uh, well, the field concept, which is really at the heart of modern uh, physics, or at least particle physics. If I were to trace back where modern physics, and theoretical physics, and particle physics, if you like, began, I would probably go back to Faraday. And he was actually quite an interesting person. He was the son of a blacksmith. He uh, got trained as a bookbinder, and I think that's uh, what allowed him to actually read a lot. And he went on to make a number of important discoveries. He discovered uh, what's called mutual induction, which means if you have an electric current that's turned on and you have another wire nearby that that induces the current in that wire, and that's what enables transformers to work. He also discovered another phenomenon where you have you gain a wire and you take a magnet and you move the magnet back and forth in that wire, it induces the current in that wire. And that's actually the basis for how motors work. So here's that, uh, basically the, the beginning of a lot of technological things that we feel about in our society. He also invented a precursor to the Bunsen burner. And we've all had experiences with Bunsen burners in high school. What's shown here is an illustration of this field concept. There's two uh, magnets that are shown here, and then scattered around here are iron filings. And these iron filings line up in the direction of the magnetic field that's coming out. So you can just visualize here the magnetic field. And uh, in its day, people thought that, oh no, this is a, just some fancy speculation, and that these fields don't really exist. And it, when we now draw charges, the here I've drawn a charge, this idea of a field line is that we, we almost can't divorce it from the idea of a charge. And that's what I've shown here. We have these fields coming out. So what does this mean that we have a field? Well, if I take another little charge and I put it near this field, near the, not near the field, near this charge, then actually it's going to experience a force in a similar way. It gets accelerated. And it gets accelerated because it experiences this field that is out of position. And so important was this concept of field that James Clark Maxwell, in one of his uh, early papers, where he developed some equations that are very important for electromagnetism, they're called Maxwell's equations, he actually uh, expresses his, uh, I guess, debt towards Faraday by actually had that title of the paper on Faraday is going to force. Hmm. So I want to come back to Faraday and just do a little thought experiment to connect this back to the Higgs boson. So imagine I have some charges here and some charges here, a different charge, and they create a uniform electric field going like this. And now I'm putting my little tiny charge particle there. Now I'm going to take these charge plates and move them further and further away from each other. So now this is getting pretty far apart. And now they're very far apart. Imagine those charge plates on one side of the universe and the other on the other side. Then all of this little particle here is noticing is this field. It doesn't know about what's going on with those charges at the other end of the universe. It just knows about this field. And it's going to get the same acceleration that it did before, the electric field that we see. So the Higgs boson is exactly the same, just the Higgs boson field. 
So here are the particles and fields that we think we know about in nature. There's, as I've been talking about electricity and magnetism, and there's a field for that, and we have detected the quanta of that, the photon. I should say quantum mechanics is a very deep connection between fields and particles, and that's what I'm trying to convey here. The strong force we have indirect, very strong indirect evidence for the existence of the gluon, but not the field. With the weak force, there is a weak field, but we haven't detected it. We probably won't be able to. And there's also the four quantum particles, which I told you about. The Higgs particle, maybe we've detected. Uh, we probably won't be able to detect the Higgs field. And actually, gravity also is a particle. Called the graviton for lack of a better name, and people are looking for that. It hasn't been detected yet. So that you can imagine the Higgs field, which gives mass to these particles I've been telling you about, is actually throughout all of space. It's everywhere. And what's different with the analogy that I just gave you with Faraday is that in Faraday's case, it actually has some sources and it's moving them away from place. Whereas uh, with the Higgs field, there are no sources. So it's really a property of empty space. We, we can't remove the Higgs, the field everywhere in space from the vacuum. I might put a stretch plate that could bring them together again and then have everything annihilated. Well, the Higgs field we can't. So that now brings me to CERN. CERN is an old uh, national laboratory that was probably built in the 1950s, I think 1952 or so. It's located outside of Geneva, uh, Switzerland. The French Swiss border goes along right through the experiment, around, uh, I think it's the solid line here. And uh, I think it was built in part back in the, that time to reconcile tension uh, after World War II. And it really has been a spirit of international collaboration for uh, both since its inception. There's over 10,000 visitors that visit it annually. These are all the different countries that are actually participating in CERN. There's over 608 universities, 103 countries, and over, I think I read somewhere, over 100 languages that are spoken. So it's, a, it's a, the Nobel Peace Prize, where we consider giving the Nobel Prize. I think they should have given it to CERN this year instead of giving it to the European Union. And here is actually the CERN experiment, the Large Hadron Collider. And it's in a very nice location, there's Lake Geneva, there's the Alps here. You can see from the cafeteria. And uh, I should just briefly mention that the U.S. has a large participation in this experiment. Uh, the Department of Energy Office of Science is contributing hundreds of millions of dollars that are moving out. And there are thousands of scientists just in the U.S. alone uh, that are working on this. It's probably over 5,000, uh, maybe a few thousand. I'm not, I'm not sure the actual number. So this is the actual collider that produced this particle. And uh, what was interesting about it is that it actually, so the protons, which were then accelerated around in this ring here, up to these large energies, they actually don't start off there. They start off somewhere else. And it takes five accelerators to accelerate these particles before they're injected into the Large Hadron Collider. So what, what's actually going on in the Large Hadron Collider? Well, we have the protons, have, that's what they're colliding. So, so this is a still colliding thing. We have a proton going in one direction and one in the other, and uh, we have a little fleshy proton there. And they go and they collide in one of these detectors and create a spray of particles. So this happens many, many times. Boom, 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 boom. And it's actually about, on average, around right now, 30 million of these collisions per second. Uh, with, which, to give you perspective, for the Gargamel experiments back 40 years ago, they had around 600,000 events over a couple of years. So this is 30 million per second, and actually at their peak, they're at 600 million per second. But what they do is they then detect all this stuff that comes out and use Einstein's equals MC squared. And actually, there's somebody uh, I just spoke to before the talk who said the first equation that shows up, that's when it's going to leave. So. Is the first equation. <laughs> and uh, by using conservation of energy, we can work backwards from these things to try to look at what actually ha happened in this brief moment when all this energy collided into a little point. So in a little bit more detail, so we have these protons that are made up of quarks, and they're coming together. And as you explain the energy here, right now, each 
We have two beams of photons that are coming and they're colliding. They each have four TeV of energy. And for you, it's Einstein's e equals mc squared. I can convert mass to energy. So this is about 4,000 times the mass of a proton that's going to be confined. It's going to be compressed, or feel like uh, possibly transferred in just uh, this brief moment of time. So they come along, and then boom, they collide. And a whole bunch of new stuff is produced. And all that energy that was in those protons then gets transferred to all these remnants. Some things just go down the beam. Other things get produced, and then they detect those. And again, just using conservation of energy and momentum to try to figure out what's going on. This is just to give you an idea. This is a event display of one such typical collision. It shows, so I should explain this a little bit. You're looking down the beam here, and you're seeing stuff that's going up transverse to the beam. And this shows a spray of particles, uh, about four or five of them. But what we're also interested in aren't just things like that, but when these particles come along and produce something that's big, that's something that's heavy. So there's a lot of energy in these protons, and so by conservation of energy, you can actually transfer that energy to something that's even heavier than the proton. That's what I've illustrated by this ball here, these big brown balls. And then typically, or maybe not, it depends on what happens, but then these particles decay very quickly. So you in a brief moment of time, you produce some heavy particle, and then that heavy particle decays. And these are the things that are actually detected in the detector, or the remnants of these of this heavy particle. And so by working backwards from the decay, from these things that you see, you can try to reconstruct that thing that was produced for just a very brief moment of time. So that brings me to these three people. Uh, these are three theorists, Ellis, Garriard, and Anopoulos, and they wrote an important paper back in the mid-70s. And the reason the paper is important is because even though this idea of the Higgs had been around and the Weinberg Salon Glashow model was beginning to get a lot of attention, the Gargamel experiment had already happened. So now the question is, well, where is the Higgs boson? Where is it? Where's this Higgs particle? And these people showed how you would actually go ahead and do that. And that's a very important contribution to any science, where you can actually go and show, well, you have some idea for something new in nature, well, how do you go and find that? And that's what they, they showed. So the Higgs, the Higgs boson can be produced in a couple of ways. I'm just going to describe one here. Actually, this one can collide and produce the Higgs boson. And I have a long quote here. You don't have to read all of it. But one thing I like about the quote is that they offer an apology to the experimentalists saying that we do not want to urge big experimental searches for the Higgs boson. Well, that's exactly what they have at the Large Hadron Flight. It's about an $8 billion experiment for the Higgs boson. So, Again, we have these photons that collide together against the backdrop of this Higgs field throughout all the space, so they're creating a little disturbance to the Higgs field, and that's what the Higgs particle is. And that's what you get. You get this Higgs boson, and you can get it for 1049. It's <laughs> not quite the same thing. You might be a little unsatisfied if this is what you ordered. And uh, one thing that's remarkable is that they're producing around 200,000 of these by the end of the year. And you think that, oh, that's just a mountain of particles for them to find. Well, actually, it's a lot more complicated than that. And actually, at, at the end of this year, they'll just have a, on the order of hundreds of these that they can actually deconstruct and say, yes, this is uh, something that's like a Higgs boson. So that's what I'm going to talk about now. So this is actually the Atlas experiment. There were two main ones, Atlas and CMS. This was a photo taken before it was complete, but they wanted to impress people. There's a little person here. The whole experiment's about six stories tall and weighs about 3,500 elephants. So it's a pretty big experiment. Uh, it reminds me of uh, Return of the Jedi and the Death Star. I don't know. But it reminded me of what I always remind when I see that. The protons are actually colliding. They're really, really tiny. They're only a millimeter across. Even though we have this six-story experiment, the things that are colliding are just a little, just a millimeter across. So it's a pretty impressive, uh, not just this experiment, but the fact that you can collide things that are just a millimeter across. So again, back to Ellis, Gariard, and Anopoulos, well, not only did they say how these things could be produced, but they said, well, how could, how could they be decayed? And they were the first people to really elucidate that. And the Higgs boson can decay in a number of ways. It's not a stable particle. It has a lifetime of about 10 to the minus 22 seconds, which is incredibly short. So it just decays right away. The uh, ways in which it decays, 
Uh, experimentally, the easiest to find are shown here, where it decays to photons. So it takes bosons and just go to a photon like that and a photon like that, or to uh, a, a Z particle, but two, two of these Z bosons that I was mentioning before, depending on its mass. And so what they do, what the experimental collaborations do is by detecting these photons, that you measure the energy and momentum of those photons. If, if you do the energy of those photons, imagine that you have a big particle like that, but it decays to a photon of this energy and a photon of that energy. Where if you just measure those two energies by the conservation of energy, you know the mass of, of the big particle. So that's basically what they look for. They reconstruct these two photons, and then they literally just uh, sorry, let me just finish that thought. I got ahead of myself. They literally uh, use E equals MC squared to just go back and reconstruct the mass. And basically, you're looking for a feature. Because every time you produce a Higgs boson, it's always going to decay. And if you imagine the Higgs boson like that, it's always going to decay into a photon with a specific energy. And so that's a feature that you're looking for. So all the events for the Higgs boson are going to be piled up at those particular masses. So in this case, these uh, protons collide, but now the Higgs boson is produced and it decays into protons. And this is a candidate Higgs boson event from the other detector, CMS, that shows two protons uh, coming out in this direction. And then from looking at the energies of those, energy and momentum, I should say, both experiments can then just plot the, basically the mass that was in that uh, pair of protons. And this is, I guess, the money plot. And if you look at uh, these, uh, both plots, what's shown here is the mass of the thing that would have been decaying into those two photons. And for both plots, you see there's a bump here, and then there's a bump there. And they both occur at the same value, which is uh, very important. It means both experiments have seen the same thing. And this is the evidence, half the evidence that was uh, presented by the collaboration uh, back in July. Uh, so that's so that's potentially the, something like the Higgs boson. So a new particle was discovered, and this is the main evidence for that. Uh, at least I would say so far. There's another way they can look for it. I was mentioning that briefly before, where it goes to a Z, and then uh, it's basically a virtual Z. But those Zs then decay to electrons, or they decay to muons, or some combination of those. And what's shown here is an atlas event where uh, this also is a candidate Higgs event, and these two blue things out here are muons, which are particles heavier than the electron, but have very similar properties. And then here are two electrons. So this is also a candidate Higgs event, and they do exactly the same thing. Using these kind of events, they could try to reconstruct the Higgs boson. And I'm showing you the CMS data here. Again, it's very similar construction. Again, you're taking these four electrons and using the momentum and energy of those, reconstructing what was basically the mass that was in that system, and then just plotting. And this big blue thing is not the Higgs boson. This is what you expect from the things that we know. And also this stuff here, but you see there's a bump, this thing in red. And that's uh, also, I mean, so this is their evidence for the Higgs boson. The, you see, don't look at the red thing yet. <laughs> be a little misleading. But look at the, just the data, which is the black dot. And you see there's an excess here. It's actually not that much. So on the basis of this alone, it may not be too convincing. It's really the data of what the photons have showed before. It's a lot more convincing. But, and you see here, there's probably only about maybe five or seven events here. So it's not that much, but by the end of the year, though, if, if everything holds up, then there'll be about three, three times as much data in, in this channel. So they've been collecting more data to analyze. And so now I want to talk just in the last few minutes about well, where are these experiments going? What else are they looking for? And also, I said this, that this is maybe the Higgs boson. Why aren't I saying this is the Higgs boson? Well, this is what's shown here is recent data from Atlas. And one of the things that's very important to check is that I was telling you the Higgs boson can decay into many ways. So it's very important for the collaboration to go and measure all those different ways in which it can decay and see if. The results they get agree with the prediction of what Higgs and those particular predictions of Monopolis and Gary Arden and so Ellis. And that's what's shown here is that if, so the whole bunch of ways in which the Higgs can decay, I've told you about the photons and these things before leptons, but it has a bunch of other ways in which it can decay. 
And what's shown here is what they've measured relative to what you expect. So if everything, uh, if this is really the Higgs boson, then these numbers would line up to one. And you see they're actually getting pretty close to that. So that's pretty good to see uh, agreement. The errors are big here. There's, uh, the proton one's a little high, but it's within the statistical error. So this is one thing that they're going to be doing and then doing better. It's really trying to measure uh, all the ways in which the Higgs boson can be produced and decayed and then checking to see if it agrees with the theoretical prediction. There's another thing that's important, which is more, more qualitative. And I think it's this feature that is uh, why many people are saying, yeah, this is the Higgs boson. And it has to do with a, a concept that's called spin. And uh, many of you are familiar with angular momentum. If I spin around like this, then I'm generating angular momentum. It's just the uh, motion of myself and uh, how my mass is distributed and the speed at which I'm uh, moving around at. And figure skaters actually use that for when they spin around and then they want to spin faster, they redistribute their mass because of conservation of momentum, they spin up faster. Well, it turns out particles also have an intrinsic angular momentum that they're always spinning. And so that's what I've shown here. These particles like the proton or the gluon, they have spin one or minus one. Other particles like the electron, they have spin a half or minus half. Well, it turns out the Higgs boson, as predicted in the, in the theory, doesn't have any spin. So it's not spinning at all. So that's a very important qualitative feature that these experiments have to measure. And that's what they'll be doing in the years to come. So we want to know, what is the spin of this new particle? And if it comes out to be zero, then they notice that it actually doesn't have any spin, then that will be a real confirmation of this theory. But it could turn out it has spin too, and then that would be a completely different particle, and this would not be the Higgs boson. So that's something that we're looking for. There's another thing that we're also looking for, and I'm just showing one example of this. So the experimentalists uh, are not just looking for a Higgs boson, but there's a whole group of things that they're hoping to look for. And uh, one of them goes by the name of supersymmetry. And supersymmetry is actually, it came out of the efforts of uh, these people and others back also in the late 1960s and early 70s. And actually, it came out of nothing to do with any of these weak interactions that I was talking about. It came out of trying to generalize Einstein's theory of special relativity and then later general relativity to a larger class of theories. And they found that there's a symmetry that uh, allows them to they change, take it up course and then convert it to another new particle that has exactly the same physical property, it has the same charge, it has the same color interactions, but it has a different spin. So this up quark, as I said before, these particles have spin half. In this new theory, it, there's, for the up quark, there's a, a new particle which has spin zero. And some people may uh, say, and I should say that actually none of these have been discovered. None of these particles on the right-hand side have been discovered. We only have these ones here. We don't know anything about those. But I've also heard people say that, well, we've also seen half of them. So uh, depending on how you think about it, this may be around the corner or not. And the reason that people are uh, actually interested in, them, in this theory in particular is because it, they can solve a problem of the Higgs boson that was actually elucidated in a different context by Victor Weisskopf back in the 1930s. This is a photo, I think also a badge photograph of him when he was in the Manhattan Project. He also went on to found, be a founder of the Union of Concerned Scientists. And uh, what he pointed out is that if people, well, let me tell you the problem, is that if you have a charged particle, and this is a problem that's been around since the late 1800s, so take the electron. And if I imagine the work I have to do to form that electron by bringing a charge from way off infinity to put it in a little tiny size, then depending on how far I try to compress that, then I have to do more and more work because I have these charges that I'm repel against each other. And that's what I've shown here. You have an electron, well, if you try to compress it to a smaller size, actually you'll find its energy gets bigger. And it gets bigger very, very quickly. It goes as one over R. What he showed is actually in the new theory at the time, which was Dirac's theory. So there was a new particle of, of which has the same properties of the electron, except it has an opposite charge. This is antimatter. So there's a, a particle called a positron, which is the antiparticle of the electron. He showed when actually you include that electron, you do the same calculation, you get the sign instead. 
So you get a lot of movement to do. It's a much more slowly varying function. And it turns out the Higgs particle has similar behavior. There are similar problems with the Higgs boson. And actually, he noticed that as well, but he didn't call it the Higgs, because obviously he didn't know about Higgs. But for particles that have very similar properties as the Higgs, he showed them to be quadratic divergent. And this is, unfortunately, this is from Mengo, but basically means you get a bad behavior like this as well. And in these supersymmetric theories that I was just telling you about, actually that bad behavior goes away. So it, it has some parallel with the, um, with the example I was just giving with the electron magnetism, where there, there was a new, a new degree of freedom that was added to positron nuclear, and that cured this bad behavior. The supersymmetry can do the same thing. There are new degrees of freedom, which again haven't been seen yet, but they can cure this bad behavior, and that's why people are excited and looking for these. And there's a second reason why people are also trying to discover some version of this theory is that versions of this theory can also have a particle which can be dark matter. And uh, that is, I, I haven't talked about dark matter at all, and I could give a whole talk on that as well, but I, I just wanted to briefly mention that that's a possible connection between, uh, there, there exists a possible connection between what's going on in this experiment at CERN and dark matter. Namely, that they they may actually produce dark matter, but again, that's very speculative. And there are many different models for dark matter. We don't really know where it is, but there's one possibility where it could actually be accessible to lighter. So this is a, a very dense slide, and it shows just a fraction of all the searches that are going on. In this case, with the Atlas experiment, I believe, looking for these SUSY theories that I was mentioning before, and the work that I do has to at least that I'm doing right now, has to do with these types of searches that are looking for super partners of the top folk and trying to improve how the experiments are looking for those particles, improving their sensitivity, and coming up with ways in which they can find these particles that haven't been thought of before. Okay, so I'm at the end of my talk. What I'm showing here are actually two photographs taken by the Hubble Space Telescope about um, 20 years ago, almost, and uh, 10 years ago, one was looking up in the north sky and one was looking down at the, at the southern sky. And what's shown here are galaxies that are about 13 billion years ago. That's almost as far as you can see right now, uh, looking out at this. These are the furthest galaxies that people can see. And I, I feel that that's what's going on uh, with this experiment at the CERN, is we are seeing down. Uh, directly as far as we can in terms of distance, it's not out in terms of space or time, like with the Hubble uh, telescope, but it's looking down into the structure of matter. And we're really, as far as we can see right now, and I think that, they, that they've discovered a particle that's very similar to the Higgs boson, it is uh, really demonstrating that, yes, we are getting to uh, a place now where we are finding new things, we are getting past the things that we already know, and what remains to be seen over the next decade is, are there, are there or whether they're going to find new things on top of what they've already been seen? Thank you. Probably not, but it also, I should say, we know very little about dark energy, and so we really don't know about what possible connections may be out there. And people really don't have any uh, credible models for dark energy other than just what Einstein did back in the, the 1930s when he introduced the cosmological constant. Now, about dark matter, I, the answer to that is yes. So uh, they're looking for dark matter these experiments. And there are also lots of experiments that I've been able to talk about today that are actually deep underground. There's an experiment that's beginning to operate right now on a mine that's underground uh, at, a, at a detector or actually a laboratory in South Dakota. And there are other 
experiments underground throughout the world that go deep underground to produce backgrounds, and they're looking for a dark matter particle to, to come in and scatter with uh, the elements that make up the detector. And so far, we only have negative evidence, which means we can only set up a limit on what the uh, the rate for, for the dark matter particles to come in and then scatter off the, the things in these detectors. But we also have limits on the Large Hadron Collider, so they're not observing some of the, the particles which, when they're produced, they could decay and give dark matter. So, so if you have a theory for uh, what sort of particles could happen at the system scale, or how they decay to dark matter, then you can go and test and say, oh, this is what you should get at the Large Hadron Collider, or you, this is what you would get in these direct detection experiments. And actually, this is something that uh, theorists are very good at, but, they, but by going by the non observation, or hopefully eventually observation of something in these two different experiments, you're actually learning something about the underlying theory. So, yes, there is actually uh, connections between uh, this experiment and some potential connections, I should say, still speculative, but potential connections uh, between. Uh, those experiments and some of these experiments that are looking for dark matter. Now, I should also say that there are other models of dark matter where you would never see it at this collider. So, unfortunately, it's not a very tight connection. And there are other experiments that are looking for the type of dark matter called an axion, and they're looking for that, but you would never see that, unfortunately, at this experiment. So, it really, whether the, the existence of possible connections really depends on your theory for dark matter. Oh, so, uh, so, yeah, I guess that can mean a couple of things. So, in, in the case of the nuclear beta decay, or so the neutron beta decay, then you have a neutron which is going to three particles. In this case, it's an electron, neutrino, and a proton. And uh, so when, when I say decay, it means that, but it also refers to the fact that the energies of those particles and their direction are actually, because of quantum mechanics, they're, they're random, which direction and which energy they come out. But what we can predict, depending on our model for that decay, is the distribution of those energies and those directions. So as before, I was showing you this um, decay spectrum from, uh, that was measuring the electron energy. So in that case, there was, that was the spectrum, so I'm pointing at something you can't see, but the, but the uh, there's a distribution, the, the electron doesn't come out at a particular energy, it has a continuous distribution. But there's another important fact, which is what's the shape of that distribution? And you're, depending on your theory, you'll make different predictions for what that distribution is. So that's also part of what's meant by the same. If that answers your question. Some of the initial data coming out of so yeah, that's a very good question. Let me go back to that slide. The answer is what I'm showing you here is data from July. And let me pull it up. So this is data from July, and we haven't received any new data from them yet, as far as I know. And you're right, that is a little high for three protons. It's within two standard deviations, but uh, we're very, very easily awaiting to see what they'll announce. Probably in this or January, I'm guessing, or February, when they'll analyze all the data they've collected this year. So this is just based on one third of the data, and it's. Maybe I should get the laser pointer. It would be very interesting and exciting if it stayed here for these error bars, which shrink maybe by maybe by half roughly, and maybe even the central value could move away. And then that would certainly be a, a very interesting discrepancy. Are there any caveats in the theory that might that possibility? Yes. Uh, so let me go back a few slides to maybe. 
this one, which shows his, the his point of view photons. Now, I'm, I'm being a little uh, cavalier here about what's going on. So this is a Feynman diagram. Where time's going in this direction, and it shows the Higgs going in for photons. But there's some physics that's going on in this interaction. And in this uh, standard model, in the Grosso one to Salon model, uh, I'm sure you don't have a slide for this, but basically what's happening is that there's, a, there's some physics that's going on here that involves new particles. Uh, actually, not new particles, sorry. It involves mainly the top quark and the W and D bosons that are appearing virtually here. And then, and then the proton is being uh, radiated off of those. If I go back a couple of slides, you can see this in one of my previous slides. It's a slightly different process. Yeah, here. So in this Feynman diagram here, I have two gluons that are fusing together to produce the Higgs boson. And there's a top force that are produced in, uh, for a very brief period of time. And it's actually the interaction of the Higgs with the top that's allowing this process. But actually, I could imagine that that's time going in the other direction. And if time goes in the other direction, then I have the Higgs boson that interacts with the uh, top force and then it decays to gluons. Which turns out there's an identical type of process where I have two top, I have top force here or also the W and the D and it's producing two photons. And that's what's giving that prediction for Higgs going to two photons, but you could imagine, actually, you had new particles that are going in here, and that would change that prediction. And actually, uh, data from the Higgs is, is, uh, on that particular measurement is already telling us something about what can or can't happen. So I, I mentioned very briefly that we have uh, this, there are all these particles that we know in nature, and in particular, there are three generations. If you bear with me a moment, let me go back to that slide. This is way, way back up here. Let me show you this slide. So I didn't talk much about this, but so here's the quarks that make up the proton. Well, it turns out there's, there's two more copies of these types of particles. And we don't know why, it's very strange, but basically we call these generations, there's one, two, and three, and they're basically Xerox copies of each other. And the reason I bring this up is you may ask, well, why not four, or five, six? Maybe there are more here, more copies, and we just haven't produced those particles. And the answer to that is that actually no. We actually know from that specific channel you're asking about, six going to two photons, that you can't have even one more generation of copies of these particles. And that, that, that would give you a rate for that Higgs to two gamma that's a factor of nine larger than what you observed. So we're actually already learning a lot uh, from the Higgs boson. Other questions? Yes, please. Now your description of uh, your analogy of the Higgs field to the electric field, mm -hmm. and the Higgs field is very different. Does that imply that the particle of nature is infinite? Yeah, so that's actually a very good question. That ties up to dark energy. And we actually don't know the energy. I mean, sorry, we don't know the answer to that. So, uh, you're right, the Higgs boson does contribute an energy to space everywhere. But if it contributed at the value that's predicted in, in the theory, then uh, our universe would have begun its inflating a uh, long, long time ago, billions of years ago. And so we, we know, actually we know very little what's happening to that energy. So there is a contribution, that Higgs field does make a contribution to the energy density of the universe. But we know that there have to be other things to cancel that. And that's part of the dark energy problem. That we, we really are clueless about that. That's a good question. Other questions? Okay, well, I'll be around so people want to come up and uh, ask me more questions. Thank you.